it may not be the most enticing topic, but it's going to be important if you want to make money in the new construction trim game because you're going to be doing a lot of built-ins, and that means in your career you're going to do miles and miles of shelving and countertops. So how you apply your nosing to plywood is actually a pretty big deal. I'm going to show you my system and methods on how I do that. I feel very quickly and effectively, and the way I do it that helps me achieve an invisible seam in a really high quality result. So hope you enjoy the video guys. Stay tuned and we'll dig right in. All right, so first off, let's get the boring stuff out of the way. How wide do you make your bookshelves? You've got your cabinet width. You're gonna to wanna to take 1 8 to 3 16th off that width. You need to remove the proper amount of material off the width of your shelf. Otherwise, if the cabinet happens to get installed out of square, or something gets a little bit wonky, whenever you go to install that shelf again after paint and after installation, it'll gouge up the paint job and that's not good. I've found the sweet spot to be to take 1 8 to 3 16th off the width of the shelf based off the interior cabinet dimension. Now for the depth, that's a little bit different story. Uh, guys might have different opinions. I like to have a quarter inch of space between my shelf and the back of the face frame. So that's the, the uh, standards that I go by and what works well for me. So it's actually really easy math in your head whenever you're breaking down your plywood for your depth, whatever the interior depth of your cabinet is, just take an inch off that and that's what you break your plywood down at. So if I've got 11 and three quarter depth on my bookcase, I'm gonna rip my plywood at 10 and three quarter because that's gonna allow for a three quarter inch thick piece of one by nosing and a quarter inch of space between the shelf and the back of the face frame. Next, it's time to slice and dice some nosing for our bookshelves. Now, sometimes I order one by two from my millwork supplier and then I don't have to rip anything down. Here, I wanted a little bit thicker shelf look, so I'm actually using one by six and I'm gonna rip that in half. Using the stop block on my miter saw station makes quick work of repeat cuts. Next, I'm gonna rip my one by sixes as closely to perfectly down the middle as I can, and then we'll move over to the joiner. Being that this is finger jointed material and these pieces are only three or four feet long, I really wouldn't have to run them through the joiner, but I'm a little bit OCD and it doesn't take that long, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that, being that I have the joiner right here in the shop. Then finishing them off with a pass through the planer is going to remove any additional saw marks and ensure they're all the exact same width. The next step that I'm going to do here is a little bit of a secret weapon of mine that very few other guys do. I actually hollow the joint on the front edge of my plywood and that's going to make the nosing come together super tight with the plywood. I'm actually going to run a router bit along the edge of all my plywood where it meets the nosing. This router bit actually has a concave shape on it, which is going to remove material on the inside edge of that plywood. It's going to create a hollowed joint, which the reason for that is whenever you put glue on that plywood, it's actually going to expand. It wants to push the nosing away from the plywood. So by hollowing that edge, it allows that nosing to hug that plywood super tight, makes it easier to clamp. Sometimes you can even just nail stuff on and get a really nice glue line that'll be invisible after you sand it. Now you can see there's a line in the center of the bit marking this uh, where you'd want to line this to the center of your workpiece. In my case, I'm all using three quarters, so I want this bit to be right in the center of that three quarter stock. And you'll notice it rounds and then it's got a pretty steep taper right here on the bit. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the video skills to pick this up well with the camera, but you've just got to trust me. You can see a little bit that that bit is concave and the top and bottom of this one by the edges line up perfectly with the bit and it's going to kind of create a hollow joint. Uh, it's going to give the glue somewhere to go and make it super tight. Now this is a dedicated router setup, so I never change this bit. This bit stays in the router under my workbench at all times. You can see I've got a clear plastic glide on guide on here. Keeps all the sawdust contained in there and it collects it pretty well. I put this Festool end on this router, had to smuggle that in from out of country, but uh, that way I can just plug it right into my hose 
with my boom arm and it works really well. But running this bit on the edge of all these shelves only takes a couple minutes and it really increases the quality. It gives the glue inside the joint somewhere to go, which is going to reduce squeeze out in the mess. But then it's also going to keep those plywood fibers from wanting to push that nosing away as the moisture expands the edge of that plywood. This is going to create a super tight hairline connection there. So whenever you paint this up, it's going to look like a continuous seam and you're not going to see that unsightly line where the nosing meets the plywood. I use this same bit on my countertops as well as cabinet ends. Whenever I have a flush end on a cabinet and I want to make that nice square connection between a face frame and the plywood, I always hit my plywood with this bit before I make that connection to the face frame. Then I can just flush it, sand it, and it's perfectly smooth and you don't get that hairline crack. Now this bit is made by Whiteside, but you can only get, a get it a couple different places, so I will link that in the notes below the video, so look for that link there to find out where to get this bit. Now that you've got your plywood prepped and your nosing prepped, you're going to do one of two things here. If you're just going to keep your nosing square or put an eased edge on it, you can go ahead and start applying the nosing to the plywood. But in my case here, I want to router a profile onto it, and I'm going to need to do that before I apply the nosing to the plywood, and it's going to be a lot easier that way. On the face of my nosing, I want to route a profile. But on the bottom inside edge, all I'm doing is easing that edge and just taking off the sharpness. One of the best ways to dress up a unit, whether it's bookshelves or a countertop, is to route a profile onto the edge of your, of your bookshelves or countertop. So here I'm just kind of sorting through my router bits, looking for a bit that might be appropriate and look decent. I ended up just taking, a, I think, a quarter inch radius bit, took the bearing off, and dropped it down to a smaller bearing, which creates a beading bit, and that'll put a nice, nice profile on these bookshelves. Now it's time to route the profile onto the nosing. You can see here it's way easier to do this whenever you can route on a flat piece of nosing versus after the nosing is attached to the bookshelf. So here I'm running with a climb cut pass, which is gonna make the cut with the bit spinning into the workpiece, and that's gonna prevent tear out. And then I'm coming back and finishing off uh, in the other direction with a standard router pass and that re removes a little bit of material that is remaining. I will still have to hit the top edge of this nosing after the nosing is applied to the plywood and the clamps have been removed after it's glued um, but I'll only be removing about a 30 second of material then if that and it's a lot easier to do. So I like to get the bulk of the material off first like this. Here you see to hold these nosings in place I'm using a Craig bench dog which is a three quarter inch hole and then I'm actually using the festival clamp which is some odd millimeter hole but you can still pound it through the three quarter holes with a hammer and it still works but this clamping system works perfect for holding these nosings in place. It'd be a lot harder to do this without this clamp. The clamp has a round shaft just like a bench dog on the bottom and that you pound down into your holes and then it's just got a cam action lever that will clamp your work pieces and then it's got quite a bit of adjustment. It'll move, I don't know, five, six inches of adjustment but it works really well and is definitely worth the money for things like this. The reason that you see me using the thin wood block with this is that way it keeps my router bit away from the plastic part of the clamp. I needed it in this case in order to keep my bit from biting into the clamp since the clamp is just about as wide as my workpiece. And of course, it's amazing how just a little bit of routing like this will turn the shop into a disaster pretty quickly with not having any kind of dust collection on these routers. But I try and stay ahead of it the best I can, getting most of it out of the way before I move on to the next step.
I recently bought this clamp rack from Woodpeckers. I used to have a homemade one that actually worked great and held a ton of clamps, but I couldn't roll it because it was so heavy. So I bought this Woodpeckers clamp rack and it's really nice because I can pull it up beside the workbench and all my clamps are right there. I do miss my old clamp rack at times because it held more clamps, but this one is very heavy duty. The casters work surprisingly well considering the weight that's on it. This is the part of the process where making a pretty sizable investment in clamps and clamping calls really pays off for me. A lot of times I have a ton of shelves to do and even using only two clamps per shelf with a call, it still takes a lot. So having uh, spent quite a bit of money on clamps, I think I have a pretty decent amount. I can do quite a few shelves. Um, it really helps having these calls with these Bessie K body clamps. If I didn't have the calls to go with them, it would take me a lot more clamps. But being that this is the case, I have two foot, three foot, and four foot calls. I can just put a clamp on each end and still have continuous clamping pressure across the whole nosing. Now, unfortunately, as with a lot of woodpeckers tools, these clamping calls only come into pr production maybe once a year or so. I'm not even sure if that, but they are a one-time tool. So whenever you see them go up for sale, you've got to buy them because they aren't available all the time. Uh, I spent quite a bit of money. I have 10 of each size of calls, uh, two foot, three foot, and four foot. So I've got 30 total and that works pretty well for me. So let's get into the process here and offer some of the smaller nuance tips to this. First thing I do is I plop my clamps down on the table about the width of the shelf. You can use the shelf itself to gauge to make sure your clamps are the right width apart. Getting the right amount of glue is kind of an art. You don't want to overdo this and have squeeze out running everywhere. The nice thing is since you hollowed the joint with the Collins ply prep bit, it actually uh, gives you a little bit of forgiveness with the excess glue because that joint is hollow, it doesn't ooze out nearly as much if you go a little bit overboard. But you still wanna try and get just the ideal amount where you're having very minimal squeeze out um, and that's gonna make things just a little bit easier. You'll see here that I'm just tacking on the nosing with a 23 gauge nailer. That's my weapon of choice. I usually use uh, the inch and 3 16 inch pins and that just holds it in the position where you need it to. I just use my fingers as a gauge and make that nosing just a hair proud of that plywood. And then I'll flush trim that off after the glue is dry and I take my clamps off. If you don't know what a clamping call is, it's a device that actually has a curve in it. Sometimes they're wood, but it's actually curved so that whenever you clamp this down, it starts with pressure in the center and as it pulls towards the end, it gives you continuous pressure across the whole workpiece. Even with the calls, it still takes a lot of clamps. I usually try and leave my nosings dry at least 15 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, depending on if I have more shelves to do. Sometimes I'll have to rush that, that way I can get clamps off and get clamping more pieces. But this is the workflow I typically have. Uh, after I let them dry a little bit, I'll pop all the clamps off and then we'll move on to the next step. Before we move on, I wanna plug the Bostitch 23 gauge pin nailer. It's my favorite pin nailer because I can put two sticks of pins in the gun which goes a much longer time whereas most pinners only allow you to put one stick in at a time. Now it's time for flush trimming and I'm going to show you one of my other favorite tool combinations that not many people know about. This is the Festool OF 1010 router set up as a lipping planer. You can see it's got a couple accessories added onto it which allow me to route in this horizontal position and uh, it works really great for flush trimming. I've got a spiral bit in here and I'll show you a little bit closer how this thing works. So let's break this down. Um, we have the handle support, which will allow 
this to ride over the top of the work piece. And then we have the dust collection piece here. So I'm gonna pop this off. Oops, wrong one. Just loosen that up. That'll come off of there. Now this rides flush with the bit here. And I always use a spiral bit with a bearing just to ensure in case this was not perfectly in aligned, this bearing will prevent the bit from cutting into the workpiece. I know some guys will use a bit without the bearing. I like to use the bearing uh, just as a little extra insurance. So then we'll come over here and all you've got to do is completely loosen this and it'll pop off. There's a little plastic O-ring, rubber O-ring that keeps that screw from falling out and you're back to essentially uh, your normal planer operate, normal router operation there. So setting it up again. So you can adjust your height up and down here. I want to be just on top of where I have this bit set. I have the bit set so that it cuts a little bit, probably about seven eighths into the material work piece. So I want my bearing to be up here to make sure I'm clearing off any glue or anything that's up here. So I'll set this up just a little bit proud of the end of the bit. And then we wanna make sure that the edge of this is in plane with the bit here. I know it is, cause I already have this set up, but you can micro adjust it from loosening this and turning this knob. And uh, I'll just go ahead and put my dust collection apparatus back on here. I have links to all this stuff in the notes. And then this plastic piece is going to keep any of that sawdust from flying up. It's going to divert it uh, into this chute here so that it can be all collected and the dust collection actually works pretty well with this thing. So as you can see, this router is absolutely perfect for horizontal flushing uh, work pieces like this. I actually think it's better than a typical lipping planer. Um, it's just no fuss once it's set up it's good to go you don't have to mess with anything and there really isn't hardly anything you can screw up with this so I wouldn't have reservations about putting it in the hands of an inexperienced guy whereas an inexperienced guy might struggle with uh, setting up a lipping planer properly so I just really love this router it actually hasn't done anything besides been set up like this for quite a few years for me uh, this is all I use this router for, but it has paid for itself many, many, many times over. It has ran miles and miles and miles of flushing on shelves and countertops and cabinet ends. It's just one of my favorite tools in the shop. Can't really imagine doing work without it anymore. The other huge advantage for me is with my boom arm being set up for Festool tools, I can just plug and go with this thing anytime and uh, it collects just about everything as far as sawdust. The other great thing about this tool is if you put a white side spiral bit on it, it will absolutely go for miles and miles and miles and you'll never even begin to think it's dull. Uh, it'll do a great job. Now being that I did flush trim the top edge of those nosings, I did hit them with the router bit again just to make sure the profile was consistent top and bottom. But as you can see, uh, nosings on countertops and shelves can be very time consuming if you're not set up properly to do it. Um, this is my system. I'd love to hear if you guys have anything you do different with your system. For the results that I get and the time it takes to do it, I don't see how I can hardly improve much upon what I've got right now. Um, clamping them up properly, 
and uh, just getting a really great glue joint that almost disappears completely with paint is really key to me and I think it sets my work apart. So love to hear your thoughts and comments. Hopefully you learned something. Be sure to like the video if it was helpful, subscribe, and hopefully we'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching guys.